There we go. Okay, so this talk is about barriers to entailment. And one example of a barrier to entailment is Hume's law, where Hume's law is the principle that says something like, you can't get an ought from an is, or maybe more generally, you can't get normative claims from descriptive claims, but that's supposed to mean you know, using logic. If your premises only contain descriptive stuff and the argument's valid, then you can't have normative stuff in the conclusion. So it's often called Hume's Law after this passage from um, the treatise. So um, let's see, uh, I'm just gonna read this out. In every system of morality, which I have hitherto met with, I have always remarked that the author proceeds for some time in the ordinary way of reckoning, reasoning and establishes the being of a God or makes observations concerning human affairs. When of a sudden I'm surprised to find that instead of the usual copulations of propositions is and is not, I meet with no proposition that is not connected with an ought or an ought not. This change is imperceptible, but is however of the last consequence. For as this ought or ought not expresses some new relation or affirmation, it is necessary that it should be observed and explained. And at the same time that a reason should be given for what seems altogether inconceivable, how this new relation can be a deduction from others, which are entirely different from it. So uh, that's about all I'm gonna say about Hume. I take it that um, in addition to whatever it was that Hume was endorsing, there's, an intuitive version of Hume's law that um, seems very plausible and that we can ask like independently from sort of historical views about Hume, um, is this correct? Can we examine it using logic? Is it something that we can prove? Um, Hume's law is just one example of a barrier to entailment. So a thesis that says that you can't get certain kinds of conclusion from certain kinds of premise. And here are some other examples. Let's see. Sorry, somehow. Okay, so um, another example is the idea that you can't get universal claims from particular ones. That's something that comes up in, um, for example, uh, Russell's lectures on logical atomism. He says, if you're gonna have something universal in the conclusion, there has to have been something universal in the premises. Uh, you can't get claims about the future from claims about the past. We might think of that as, as kind of Hume's second law, because of course, um, that's also a famous um, Humean idea. Um, then there's kind of a, a modal um, barrier thesis. So you can't get claims about how things must be if you only have claims about how things are. Um, and then the last one that, that I'll be talking about you can't get indexical sentences from non-indexical ones. So there's this thought that um, indexical expressions are expressions which mean different things given different contexts of use. And that means that the sentences in which they're embedded are gonna mean different things given different contexts of use. And that results in some sort of barrier. If you only have non-context sensitive sentences, um, then you won't be able to get a context sensitive conclusion um, in a valid argument. Okay. so. We've got on the board now these like five uh, barriers to entailment if we include Hume's law. Hume's law is very controversial, right? So there's a huge literature, um, sometimes proposing counterexamples to the law, sometimes arguing in the face of those counterexamples that it holds even so. So just briefly gesturing at this list to save time, here are some people who have endorsed or defended some version of Hume's law. Here are some people who have rejected it and said that it's false. Um, always fun to point out that Arthur Pryor shows up in, in both of these lists. Um, but here's a, here's a project and it's, it's my project. Um, like one thing that you might be able to do is formulate some theorem, some principle um, that has each of the barriers of um, to entailment as an instance, including Hume's law. And in that case, it would seem as if um, the platitudinous barriers to entailment, the ones that are regarded as sort of uh, very uncontroversial, like the idea that you can't get universal claims from particular claims um, or claims about the future from claims about the past would seem to provide some support for Hume's law, given that you have a unified 
treatment of them all. So that's this kind of the project that we're going to be engaged in. This is part of this talk is a part of um, a much bigger project that is a book. And so one of the things I have to think about in giving this talk is what to include and what not to include. And one of the things I'm going to be doing is just picking one of the famous proposed counterexamples to Hume's Ute Law and kind of using that as my way into the positive project to motivate my formulation of Hume's Law, um, which will gradually appear throughout this talk. Um, so I'll start by going through that counterexample and talking about what we, what, what we might say about it. And then like, here's a rough guide to the arc of the rest of the talk. There's gonna be a section on deontic modal logic, kind of setting things up so that we have um, a formal system for examining the problem. And then there'll be another section that this time will be on tense modal logic. So we'll start talking about the past and future and the past future barrier. And we'll make a bit more progress on the problem in that framework. And then once we've done that, we'll talk a bit about indexicals and indexical logic. That section is not gonna be in as much detail, largely for time reasons, but um, that's where we'll see the outline of the solution to the problem. And then we will go back through the tense logic case and the normative case to look at how to apply this solution in those cases. So once we start going back to the tense logic and then back to the normative case, you know that the begin sort of the end of the talk is approaching. Okay, so what's this proposed counterexample to Hume's law? So you find this in a few places, but one place where there's a succinct statement of it that actually is just appears in a single paragraph and so is nice and quotable is Mavroda's in an analysis article from 1964. So here's his setup of the counterexample. Many ethical philosophers appear to accept the view that ought implies can. This view, which seems quite plausible, can perhaps be formulated more precisely as one. Statements of the form N ought to do X entail the corresponding statements of the form N can or is able to do X. But one is equivalent to two. Statements of the form N cannot is unable to do X entail the corresponding statements of the form. It is not the case that N ought to do X. So he's just contraposed. And two appears to say that there is a non-normative statement which entails a normative one. So there's the counterexample to Hume's law. Okay, with the tools of deontic modal logic, we can make this even more succinct. So here is a statement of ought implies can. If it ought to be the case that P, so this is our ought operator, um, it follows that it's possible that P and then we contrapose that and it gives us, if it's not possible that P, then it's not the case that it ought to be the case that P. And now we point out that the premise doesn't appear to have any deontic operators or any normative language in it. The conclusion clearly does, there's that ought operator. And so it looks like we've got a counterexample to Hume's law. Okay, so what are we gonna do? Um, there are, just sort of cutting up the logical space for a minute, there are four things that we might say if we want to defend Hume's law. And the first thing you might think of is to say, well, maybe uh, it's not possible that P is somehow surreptitiously a normative claim. Of course, that would take some explanation and some defending, but it does seem like one way you could go. Another possibility is you could say that it's not the case that it ought to be P, is not really normative. And if that were the case, we wouldn't have a counterexample either. There's a bit to be said um, that can make that sound more plausible off the bat. So some of the barriers to entailment have conclusion classes, like, like normativity or universality or necessity um, that are not closed under negation. So if you think about um, for all x, f of x, in just first order logic. The negation of that would be like not for all x f of x, but that's equivalent to exist in x such that not f of x. And that doesn't seem like a sentence that is itself universal. 
And so it's fairly plausible that the class of universal claims is not closed under negation. Maybe the normative claims are like that, right? So even though it's clear that it ought to be the case that P is normative, maybe not ought to be the case that P doesn't count as normative after all. Anyway, that's, that's making two a little bit more plausible. I'm actually gonna take back a lot of what I've just been saying. Two is not the way that I wanna go, but um, I think it's kind of interestingly tempting anyway. Okay, third possibility, we could say that the argument isn't valid. Um, that's one way of thinking about how um, Charles Pigdon's account of Hume's law um, engages with this kind of problem. Um, I'm not gonna be saying a lot about that um, in this talk, but it's a, a direction you can go. And then finally, you can restrict the barrier so that it's no longer in conflict with this kind of example. So you could imagine a version of Hume's law that says, okay, if your premises are all descriptive and your conclusion is normative, then the premises don't entail the conclusion unless, and there's some condition that you put in there that has to be met. That would be a restricted version of Hume's law. And if this particular counterexample meets that restriction, then we'd have a restricted version of Hume's law that wouldn't be in conflict with it. Um, I think you can look at Gerhard Schertz's uh, general Hume's law principle and see that as basically a restricted um, version of Hume's law. There are natural worries that you would have about this kind of way of going. You know, first of all, you've got to know what the restrictions are. That's very non-trivial. And second, you might worry that it looks too ad hoc. Um, maybe we're just sort of messing around with Hume's law and making it uh, less plausible, less intuitive, less unified um, in response to one of these counterexamples. And there might be further counterexamples down the line that are also going to be problematic. In fact, I now think that four is the right way to go. So that although my approach to Hume's law is very different from Schertz's um, in many ways, about this, I think he's right. The way forward in response to this counterexample from Mavrodas is to restrict the barrier. And so what you're gonna see in this talk is uh, a gradual formulation of a restricted version of the barrier that doesn't conflict with this counterexample and some intuitive story about why that's the right way to go. Okay, so, um, one thing that I just want to um, comment on before I go any further is the plausibility or the like likely success of that strategy of saying that normative claims are not closed under negation. So we have this apparent counterexample to Hume's law, which I've called here DM2, it's for deontic modal um, two. Uh, that's the one that has like non-normative stuff on the left, but normative stuff on the right and tempted us to say, well, maybe normative claims are not closed under negation. But what I wanna point out is that these two deontic modal principles are just two of a much larger set of deontic modal principles that quite plausibly stand or fall together. Like they're pretty closely related. So here are some others. Here's DM3. If you substitute not phi for phi in DM2, and you take the operators to be interdefined in the standard ways, you get if phi is necessary, then it's permissible that phi. Also sounds fairly plausible to me, but in this case, we don't have a negation on the left-hand side of the turnstile, and we don't have a negation on the right-hand side of the turnstile. And so this move of saying, well, if there's a negation on the front, it might not be normative, and doesn't seem to be available. Um, we can also contrapose that, of course, and then there's this principle that's a little bit stronger than DM1, but can be justified in similar ways. Um, if P is permissible, then P is possible. And then, of course, we can contrapose that. We can substitute not phi in, do the similar things. And now we can see two principles that don't have negation in. These are the ones with the red, um, but seem to be getting normative conclusions from premises that don't contain any normative operators. So I think the problem's more general and the solution is gonna have to be more general as well and less focused on negation. Okay, so what are we gonna do? Well, we're gonna take a look at a very simple example of a deontic modal logic. Um, it is pretty much the simplest deontic modal logic I could come up with that um, 
uh, validates the deontic modal principles um, that we've been looking at, and so will enable us to deal with this kind of um, counterexample. And the way I'm going to introduce the logic is by introducing a kind of model, and then we'll use these models to give us an entailment relation on the language. So entailment is basically truth preservation across those models. So next part of the talk is what do these models look like? Let's see. Okay, so we'll call it DML for deontic modal logic. And a model is a quadruple of W. W is a non-empty set of, you can think of them as possible worlds. Um, and so here is a little diagram. This is a picture of a particular set W. And you can see that this set has five possible worlds in it. Second thing that models have is a set S, and S has to be a non-empty subset of W. And you can think of this as the set of superb worlds, so S for superb. And these are the worlds where everything is like normatively okay. They're the deontic heaven worlds, the worlds where you know, that's what you're aiming at, okay? So on these little pictures of models, I'll represent S by shading in um, the region that has the S worlds in it. So in this example of a model, W1 and W2 are members of S. Okay, third thing in our quadruple is there's an actual world in the model, like a model um, that we use, sorry, a world that we use um, to decide whether or not a sentence is true with respect to the model. So I've turned that middle world into a little box and put an at on it. That's how you can tell in the diagram that it's the actual world. And if something's true at the actual world, then it's true in the model. And then the last thing we have is an interpretation function that tells us for any sentence letter and any world, whether or not that sentence letter is true at that world. And in this diagram, I'm gonna represent the true sentence letters by writing them under the worlds. So in this model, um, R is true at the actual world and P and Q are true at W2. Okay, so that's, that's what the models look like. We have to do a little bit of bookkeeping just to talk about um, the operators and how they get their truth values and then how we get a logic out of these. So first of all, it's worth noting that one of the ways in which this logic is simple is there's no accessibility relation. And so box phi, will be true just in case phi is true at every world in W. Um, and then the two deontic operators, it's permissible at phi, and it ought to be the case that phi, um, they're defined by looking at S. So it's permissible that phi is true just in case there's at least one world in S where phi is true. So for example, in this model, it's permissible that R is true because R is true at W1 and W1 is an S. And it ought to be the case that phi is true just in case phi is true throughout the gray shaded region throughout S. Okay, so it ought to be the case that P is true in this model. Okay, um, truth in the model is truth that the model's actual world. So for example, R is true in this model. Um, and then entailment is truth preservation over models. So gamma, any, any uh, model that makes gamma true has to make phi true as well. Okay, so that gives us like a formal system for thinking about the problem. This turns out to be a logic um, that validates all those deontic modal principles, but that doesn't solve the problem for us, right? It just gives us a way of laying it out. And we've still got this question, um, is this a counterexample to Hume's law? Let's say from it's not possible that P you can get, um, um, it's not the case that you would ought to be the case that P. So given my strategy of dealing with um, Hume's law by trying to subsume it under the more general case of barriers to entailment, this uh, methodology kind of opens up to us where we can say, well, do we have the same problem? Does the same issue arise? with any of the other barriers to entailment. And then we could look at how things go in that case and what's plausible to say in those cases 
and then you know, generalize back to the Hume's law case. So I want to suggest that there is a similar issue that arises for the past future barrier. So that's what this next section is going to be about. Okay. Okay. So in addition to the thought that ought implies can, you might think that will implies can, where when you spell that out, what it means is only possible stuff can happen in the future. Right? And if I were going to write this down as a, a principle using a tense operator instead of a deontic operator, then I could have um, future phi entails possible phi. Okay. Now, I think there's some complexities here to do with the fact that there's more than one way to understand possible in English and that we can have it being um, time relative or not time relative. Um, I won't go into that a lot for reasons of time right now, but the short, the short part of this is that you have to take the non-time relative, the absolute sense of possible to get these principles um, to work out. But we're interested in principles that threaten um, the barriers. So we're gonna like, take that sense of possible. Okay, so we get that principle and then we find a similar range of corollaries when we um, think about tense modal logic. So this G is at every time in the future. So um, if at every time in the future phi, well, that entails that phi is possible. And then we can contrapose that and we can substitute not phi for phi. That gives us this, if phi is necessary, then phi happens in the future. That doesn't seem to have any negations in it and so on, right? And now we have a selection of tense modal principles about the interaction between the tense and the modal operators. And uh, some of these seem to take us from things that are not about the future to conclusions that are about the future. And so they seem to threaten the barrier to entailment that says, if your premises don't contain any stuff about the future, then your conclusion can't either if this argument is gonna be valid. Okay, so if we're gonna think about that, we're gonna need a tense modal logic, right? So that's gonna mean another set of models for thinking about um, tensor modality. So here we go. This time we have, again, some non-empty set W, think of that as a set of possible worlds. Um, we're also gonna have T, a set of, well, I'm gonna call them times. Strictly speaking, um, they're gonna be the set of integers. You can do this just as well with say the set of reals, but it makes it much harder for me to draw diagrams. So I'm just gonna take them to be the set of integers and keep my diagrams a little, a little bit less complicated. Um, and um, it's gonna, we'll see once we get to the interpretation function that sentences and sentence letters get their truth values relative to a pair taken from W and T. So a world at a time is what you need to get a truth value for a sentence. And within any one model, some world and time, which you know in practice means some cell in this table is gonna be the actual world's now, right? So the, the, actual, the actual world and the present moment, right? And they are at an N um, in the model. In the model that we've got here, that's the cell that's right in the middle that has um, a P in it. Um, and then there's an interpretation function that takes you from pairs of possible worlds and times and sentence letters to a truth value. And we'll represent the true sentence letters by writing them in the cell that corresponds to the time and world um, with respect to which they're true. So as long as uh, we don't let it get too big or as long as we only look at part of the model, we can draw little tables like this to represent the situation. Um, so this column right in the middle, the central column in this table, that's the actual world. And then the future goes, well, the time goes from the bottom of the model to the top. So T1 is in the past, T4 is in the future. We're relying here on the standard ordering of the integers. Um, so these things are ordered, but I haven't put a separate um, ordering relation into the model just like we don't have a, an accessibility relation. Um, so in the actual world in this model, at T1, P and Q are true, but then Q goes false, stays false, then Q comes true again, and then finally at T4, R is true as well. 
there are different possible progressions. They get called U and W here. And there's shading in this diagram as well. This shading doesn't correspond to anything special that's mentioned in the like um, five tuple that specifies the model, but it's all the future times in the actual world. So N is the present moment. And every time in the actual world after that of shaded gray, that's just kind of going to make it easier for us to spot the actual future, which is going to be important um, later on. Okay, so a little bit of bookkeeping. Um, so in the future, phi is going to be true at a world in the time, just in case there's some future time in that world where phi is true. That's sort of what you'd expect. A little bit more um, surprising, maybe, is the interpretation of the modal operators. So diamond phi, it's possible that phi is true just in case there is some cell in the entire table where phi is true. Okay, so it doesn't have to be at that time. Um, and that means that box phi is incredibly strong. For box phi to be true, phi has to be true at every cell in the table, right? So I've drawn this table to represent a model in which P is true in every cell, like every world in time. Um, and that means that it's necessary that phi comes out true there. Okay. Um, once again, truth in the model um, is truth at the, the now and the actual world of the model. And entailment is about truth preservation over those models. Okay. So, that gives us another formal system. How does that help us solve any of these problems? Okay, suppose you're gonna to try to formulate the past future barrier, right? And then prove it as a meta theorem about this logic. So you wanna say, um, if all the premises are about the past or not about the future and the conclusions about the future, then the premises don't entail the conclusion you're gonna need some definition that tells you which are the sentences in your formal language that are about the future, right? So you need a definition of future sentence, right? So how is that gonna work, okay? Here is kind of a vague idea that we're gonna make more precise over the next few slides. So the vague idea is sentences are really about the future if their truth value is somehow sensitive to changes to the future. So if you, you, know, you have the sentence, um, I will ride my bike, right? Um, and maybe that's true because I'm gonna ride my bike tomorrow, but if the future were different, if um, I don't know, I, uh, I die now and so um, I'm not riding my bike tomorrow, then the sentence would be false, right? And the thought is that that's somehow like key to what, to being about the future. Changes in the future can make a difference to your truth value, okay? Thing is sensitive is a bit vague and changes to the future is a bit vague. So we're gonna look at some precipitations of those, okay? So two things you might mean by changes to the future and also two things you might mean by sensitive to. So first up, thoughts about changing the future as understood like changing one of these models into a different one of these models. So the first way you might think about this is unrestricted future switching. Any changes to the future of the actual world. So in practice, that means you look at the gray box in the table on the left, and you're allowed to change the stuff that goes on in that gray box in any way that results in something that's still a model. So we could like make PQ and R false at T4, and we could make uh, P go false and R true. And then we'd end up with a model on the right-hand side instead. And because the only things we changed was stuff in that gray box and the result is still a model, then the new model is a unrestricted future switch of the first model. Okay. So one thing that I think is worth noticing about this way of thinking about unrestricted future switching is it can change the truth value of box P, right? So you might have thought box P is not about the future, right? I'm inclined to think box P is not about the future, but box P is true in the model on the left and it's not true in the model on the right because Q isn't true at T4 at or T3 at, okay? Um, of course, um, FP 
right? That also changes its truth value. So that's also getting like classified as future, right? But it's worth noting about unrestricted future switching that it seems to be classifying sentences that I'd be inclined to say were not really future sentences as sentences about the future. If we didn't want that to happen, something we could use instead is restricted future switching. So here's the second kind of future switching. This time, what you're allowed to do is take any future that's not the actual future and swap it with the actual future. So in this model, the actual future has been swapped with the future of you, right? Just meaning we've taken the sentence letters after N for the possible world you and written them in for at instead of you and vice versa. If we do that, then uh, let's see, future Q, that can change its truth value, that does between these two models, but box P wouldn't change its truth value because if box P is true, P has to be true in every cell. And so no amount of switching around the future is gonna make it go false, okay? So restricted, restricted future switching seems to distinguish between say box P and, and FP and being about the future, which, which seems useful, okay. Second way in which it's kind of vague to think, well, stuff about the future will change its truth value with, you know, if you change the future. Um, there are two different things you might mean by being sensitive to changes to the future, one stronger and one weaker. So here's um, what I'm gonna mean, like you don't really need to read through these definitions um, very carefully, here's, here's the idea. Um, so you might require that a sentence be um, future switch fragile, where that means that any time you have a model that gives the sentence a truth value, there's gonna be some future switch of that model that changes the truth value, okay? There's something weaker you might think, which is there's at least one case where you have a model that gives this sentence a truth value, say it makes it true, um, and some future switch of that model will make it false, right? That's enough to show that it's sensitive to um, future switch um, changes. Um, it doesn't have to always be possible with every single sentence, right? You might wonder why um, this distinction uh, matters. One of the reasons it matters is that disjunctions and also certain kinds of um, conditionals, they are future switch breakable without being um, future switch fragile. And so this is gonna make a difference to whether or not this kind of sentence gets classified as, as being about the future. Um, which if you know the debate over say Pryor's counterexample to Hume's law um, turns out to be pretty important. Um, second thing about this that is, is kind of important is that the stronger property fragility. So being such that whenever say the sentence is true in a model, this some future switch in the model that makes it false, that makes it really easy to prove that you can't get sentences about the future from sentences about the past. And when the proof basically goes, if your sentences about the past, the ones that just don't change their truth value with changes in the future, but your future sentences are future switch fragile, then if you have a model of the premises, right, either that makes the conclusion true or it doesn't, if it doesn't, you've got a counterexample. If it does, just future switch until the conclusion goes false. You know that's possible because it's future switch fragile, right? The premises will still be true because they're not future switch fragile. So you, then you'll have a new counterexample, okay? That doesn't work in the case of future switch breakability because there's no guarantee for any one model that there'll be a future switch that makes um, the sentence false. And so, if we're gonna go with future switch breakability, makes it harder to prove um, the barriers. Um, it may, however, be a more suitable um, property if we're gonna prove a restricted barrier. Okay, so some of that was kind of fast. Here is a little table that kind of draws together um, things that we could spend a lot more time talking about, but if you want like, a kind of quick and dirty uh, argument for going with column D, which is restricted future switching and breakability, then you could say this, I don't want box P to come out as future. That doesn't seem right. So I don't want column A or column B because um, they use unrestricted future switching. So let's use restricted future switching. 
Um, but I don't want in the future P to come out as not future because that seems silly. So I better go with con D. Okay. All right, the big sort of question mark with column D is how do we actually prove the barrier given that we're using breakability and not fragility. So here, I guess I've written option D gives us the most intuitive taxonomy, except it isn't obvious how to prove the barriers with breakability rather than fragility. Maybe that's actually a positive if we're interested in a limited version of the barrier, one that holds except in some special cases. Okay, we still don't have um, like a, a formulation of the barrier. We have some sense that it's gonna be formulated in terms of unrestricted future switching and breakability. Um, but how's the limit clause gonna go? How's the one that says, unless the following condition is met? Okay, so here's the bit where we're gonna to switch to talking about indexicals. Do we get a similar issue with any of the other barriers? Right, so we've got the deontic modal, yeah, deontic modal case from it's necessary that P, we can get it's permissible that P looks like a violation of the um, descriptive normative barrier. We've got from it's necessary that P we can get in the future, it's the case that's P looks like a violation of the um, non-future to future barrier. But then here's another case that brings in um, indexicality. So this I here in the conclusion is supposed to be the first person indexical, right? And this argument in English says, if everything is Q, then I am Q, right? That seems valid. Intuitively, it's valid. It's valid in the logic of demonstratives, like standard logic of indexicals. And you can kind of see like why. I mean, QI or IMQ is gonna change its truth value given different utterers. If the person uttering it is Q, then um, it's gonna come out true. But if you move the context so that the speaker is not Q, then uh, it'll come out false. And the only situation in which you're not gonna get that variation to give you a variation in truth value is if everyone's Q, right? And so if your premises have this general claim in them, you're gonna be able to get this indexical conclusion, um, even though indexical sentences change their truth value with changes in context of utterance. They're like sensitive to changes in context of utterance, if you like. Okay, so, I think in the case of the indexical barrier, it's much clearer what we ought to say about this kind of counterexample. Okay. So um, if you have an argument, this is kind of the intuitive case for the indexical barrier. If you have an argument C, so some set of, sort of constant sentences entails I, you would expect to be able to generate counterexamples by finding a model in which C is true and then varying the context until I goes false. So you would expect there to be a barrier, but there's one situation in which that intuitive motivation fails. If making C true has restricted the model so that no contexts are available that would make I false, for example, if all the context shifts of models that make C true make I true, then that won't work. Okay, but that also suggests a way to state the limit on the barrier theorem. So here's a statement of the indexical barrier theorem. If gamma is non-indexical, meaning context shifts never change the truth value. And phi is indexical, meaning that um, it's breakable with context shifts. Then gamma doesn't entail phi unless every context shift of any model that makes gamma true also makes phi true. Right? So we can prove that. That turns out to be uh, relatively straightforward, but moving on for um, time reasons. Um, the solution is applicable in the tense modal case as well. So here's a definition of a future sentence. A sentence is future if and only if it is restricted, um, future switch breakable. That's column D from our selection. And then we can specify the theorem like this. If gamma is non-future and phi is future, then gamma doesn't entail phi unless every future switch of any model that makes gamma true also makes phi true. Okay, proof is directly analogous to the previous one, 
And so now we can ask what happened to the counterexample? So one of our past future counterexamples was necessarily P entails in the future P. And we can ask whether the premises are really future given our definition. And in fact, they are. So unrestricted future switching, sorry, restricted future switching, uh, remember, doesn't change the truth value of box P um, in a model. And so uh, box P is going to count as past, as I think is sort of most intuitively would. It's, it's not about the future anyway. Um, in the future P, however, is future switch breakable. And so it counts as future. But any model of box P is such that all future switches of that model make FP true. So the argument is valid, but it meets the unless clause um, for the theorem. So it's not in conflict with it. OK. Last thing we have to do is apply all this to the normative case. Right? So one of our first questions is going to be, how do we decide which sentences in the language of the Dionzic uh, modal logic are the normative sentences? Right? Remember, there were questions about, is it closed under negation, like all kinds of things like that. So we're going to participate in an idea, which actually I forgot to mention at the beginning of the talk. Um, but the idea is this, normative sentences are the ones whose truth value is breakable with changes in the normative standards. And so um, Humberston in his survey article about um, the is-ought debate in logic traces a version of this idea um, back to uh, Kamen's article from 1988. So it does have um, a bit of history in, um, in this discussion. Um, okay. What does changing the normative standards actually look like? You know, we, we said changing the future, um, and then we had some questions about what does changing the future actually look like in our models? What does changing the normative standards look like in our deontic modal logic? Okay, it looks like changing which non-empty subset of W is S. Okay, so call this operation S shifting. Here is an example. The model on the right, is the same as the model on the left, except for the shaded area. So we've moved that, we've changed the membership of S. Used to be W1, W2, now it's W2 and W4. And this kind of move, changing which non-empty subset of W counts as S, will change the truth values of some sentences and never change them for others, right? So, um, Here's the definition of normative. A sentence S is normative if it's S breakable. And then on this test, some of the sentences that turn out to be normative are happily, it ought to be the case that P, it's permissible that P, the negations of both those sentences turn out to be normative. And also important for the debate elsewhere, uh, disjunctions and conditionals that are mixed like these ones. Some senses that turn out to be non-normative uh, include things that don't have any deontic operators in them, uh, things that just have um, modal um, operators in, like box P and diamond P. Um, there are tautologies there, or logical truths, um, uh, unsatisfiable sentences. It ought to be the case that P, and it's not the case that it ought to be the case that P. Why do they turn out to be non-normative? Well, it's because changing which set is S can't change their truth value. If they're logical truths, they're true in every model. If they're unsatisfiable, they're not true in any model. So they don't count as normative in this sense, even though there are normative operators in there. Okay, so we've got a definition. We can use that to formulate the barrier. If gamma is non-normative and phi is normative, then gamma doesn't entail phi unless for all models M of gamma, every model N such that N is an S shift of M, is such that uh, phi comes out true there. Okay, um, simple proof just in the same way as previously. And so now we've got one question left, which is what do we say about that counterexample from Mavrotis, right? That's the thing that motivated all of this. So we've got, it's not possible that P, therefore it's not the case that it ought to be the case that P, um, it turns out that not possibly P is not S shift breakable, like changing which set of worlds is the 
um, superb set, doesn't change the truth value um, of that. And so the premises are descriptive. It's not the case that it ought to be the case that P is S shift breakable, however, right? Sometimes changing um, which set is S will change its truth value. And so it is normative. However, the argument meets the theorem's um, less clause. In models of not possibly P, there are no S shifts that can make not what the case that P false. So that means that it's not a counterexample to this restricted formulation of Hume's law. Um, and so not a problem. Um, okay, and that's the end. Thank you very much.